objectives for my research. The first was focused on education and outreach, and the second objective um, was to measure the amount of saffron, which is a known carcinogenic compound that's found in a traditionally made cup of sassafras tea. Um, I worked with the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians who are in Western North Carolina. Um, they live in what's called the Koala Boundary. Um, and this research came about during a meeting with representatives and members of the Eastern Band um, as they thought this project would be useful for both Cherokee and non-Cherokee. Um, as many people are wary of sassafras tea and products made from sassafras um, because they heard it's harmful and it, it causes cancer. If you drink this tea, you're going to get cancer and die. So they thought, okay, well, let's look at this. Let's look at the tea and measure the amount of saffron. Um, Um, and in this project, we have also been working with the Center for Cherokee Plants, which is a nursery that um, <laughs> it's a nursery that propagates culturally important plants um, in Bryson City in connection with the the band, the Eastern Band. Um, so, for the first objective of this research, um, the education outreach projects. Um, these projects are essential when working with Native communities because they're giving their time and their energy to work with you. Um, so, we worked with the Extension. Um, office up there as well as um, the Center for Cherokee Plants like I mentioned before. Um, the center has been instrumental in helping in supporting this project by helping us connect to the community. Um, in return we have helped establish a stand of sassafras trees up there. We created a GIS map, um, pamphlets, and um, we perform propagation trials on, on sassafras. Um, so the rest of this presentation will be about the second objective or um, measuring the amount of saffron that's found in a traditionally made cup of tea. Um, and the reason why we're examining sassafras tea in the first place is because the FDA has um, banned the use of sassafras on the market. So you can't sell sassafras tea, you can't sell sassafras syrup or root beer made from sassafras bark. You can't, um, you haven't been able to do this since 1960. Um, and the reason why they did this is because there were um, laboratory studies using laboratory rats on um, injecting them with saffron, and they found that these um, <laughs> that <laughs> these um, these rats developed um, liver cancer, and so um, due to that, they banned they banned the sale of um, sassafras products. Um, and on the commercial side, it was regularly added to food and beverages as flavoring and fragrance. And on the personal side, it's been used historically by Native American tribes for a very long time. Um, as well, when European settlers came into the same regions in the Appalachian Mountains, they started using the plant as well. Um, the plant was used for medicinal purposes, as, um, mainly as a spring tonic, so they, they consumed it in the spring. Um, and they also used it um, winter, spring, fall as a pleasant drink, a hot drink that you you consume when it was cold outside. Um, typically, one or two cups are consumed a day, um, but three at the maximum if you're sick and you, you're using it medicinally. Um, some of you might have had the root beer last night made from sassafras root. That's um, one of the things that you can find in these type of gatherings or at a um, like at a like a farmer's market or something like that. Um, on the market, you can find saffron free extracts of root beer. Um, you can also find um, filet, which is used for gumbo. It's a soup thickener. It's made from dried sassafras leaves. Um, so the plant, sassafras albinum, you can see it kind of in the background of my first slide, which is the only one working. <laughs> um, it's a Eastern North American species. It's fairly common in many habitats. Most of you who live in the Appalachian Mountains have most likely seen it. It's um, easy to identify. It's prolific in mountain, mountainous regions under 4,500 feet. It's a generalist species, and it can tolerate both full sun and partial shade. You can find it on edges of fields and in edge of um, forest. The roots release allelopathic compounds, and that means that they limit the growth of surrounding vegetation um, so that sassafras can form colonies. Um, these allelopathic compounds, um, which are their essential oils, they're primarily composed of saffron, which is the focus of the study. Um, so saffron is a phenylpropanoid. It is part of a group of compounds that have aromatic benzene rings. So if you dig up sassafras root and you smell it, that's primarily what you're smelling. 
Um, phenylpropanoids have taste and scent properties that are used throughout the plant kingdom. Um, they're used to deter herbivores and pathogens, to attract pollinators, and also protect against um, ultraviolet light. Um, so in the slide, I had a chain of events that showed exactly what happens when you ingest saffrol or when a laboratory rat ingests saffrol. Um, saffrol itself does not lead to liver cancer. Um, when the body interacts with saffrol, it, me it produces metabolites that cause the liver cancer that it's known for. Um, there are two main ways that saffrol um, can cause cell and uh, genetic damage. Um, but again, it's the, it's the metabolites that attach to the DNA, and it can cause mistakes, mutation, mutation and eventually carcinogenesis. Um, and these, this, these metabolites uh, focus on the liver, which is the detoxifying organ of the body. Um, so there have been many studies that have examined the carcinogenic tendencies of, of saffron on very high concentrations, on the order of 500 to 1,000 milligrams per kilogram. Um, but one index found, or they, they um, analyzed, or they quantified it, and they found that about 1.2 1, 1 milligrams per kilogram is the amount that humans are ingesting every day. And, and we get the, this quantity from spices like black pepper, cinnamon, ginger, um, anise root, like all these different spices that we use on, a, on an everyday basis. Um, and one study pointed out that the large doses of saffron that they're using in these laboratory studies can accumulate in tissue muscle, and this increases the possibility of carcinogenesis. This may be causing false or overestimated concern with the compound. Um, so I'm going to recap before I move on to my methods and materials. Um, the Food and Drug Administration banned the, the sale of products made with sassafras, and as I mentioned before, um, there's saffron present in, in small amounts in the spices that we use every day. Um, the problem is that though the carcinogenic properties of saffron are well established, um, no one has actually tested to see if sassafras products contain the saffron. Um, and since it's a, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> since it's a, um, the type of compound that it is, it's, um, it's an essential oil, so it's volatile. So there have been other studies that we found on saffron containing species that they applied the traditional um, method of preparation, and this significantly reduced or eliminated the saffron that was found in the food or beverage. Um, so with, th with that, we went on and um, we talked to um, members of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, as well as Cherokees that grew, or as long as, uh, ugh, as well as non-Cherokees who grew up in the Appalachian Mountains, and they grew up um, drinking sassafras tea. Usually, they're taught by their grandparents or parents. Um, my, for my harvesting methods, um, and I used these methods based on the conversations I had with these people, um, the roots were harvested in Highlands, North Carolina, and um, harvested from about nine different trees or colonies, and they represented a variety of age classes and habitats, and those age classes and habitats will have a variety of levels of saffron, because the older the tree, we think that the more likely, or the more saffron it'll have. Um, sassafras root is typically air-dried and stored in a breathable bag. The roots can be sliced up um, a number of ways, um, though I chose um, mincing them into small pieces, and that was for when I made tea later, I could combine a lot of, um, a lot of root into one cup of tea and hopefully represent um, different levels of saffron from those different age classes of trees. Um, so tea can be made from either fresh or dried root. Um, I chose the dried root method. And um, to do this, you need to rehydrate the root, so you need to boil it, let it sit for a few hours overnight, and then reboil it again until it reaches the de desired color. And this is where I had a favorite slide because it showed <laughs> it showed the color of sassafras tea. Um, and one person that I talked to, because I was trying to figure out exactly how to describe that color, because some people said it's a warm brown or it's a, a honey color. And one person said um, amber beer. So I had a picture of amber beer up there, but that's okay. <laughs> and so I'm going to move on to my second objective of my research. Um, we analyzed T samples um, with high performance liquid chromatography, or HPLC. Um, and we modified the methods based on a, another paper by Reinertsen that studied another saffron containing species in the Lauraceae family. Um, so the goal of the chemical analysis was to compare two methods of preparation. 
Uh, the first was the method required by the Food and Drug Administration in order to legally sell sassafras products. Um, the second is the traditional method that I just described. Um, we're hoping to compare the methods by quantifying the amount of saffron that were present in the samples. Um, so we also ran an agitate sample that was um, made by agitating the root in cold water without any heat, because we were testing to see if heat played a different played a role in um, volatilizing the saffron. Um, so I know you can't see the numbers, but um, for my results, I found that the FDA method was very effective in eliminating the saffron. Um, while the traditional method had, did not completely remove saffron, um, there was about 183 um, milligrams per cup. Um, the agitate had, a, and compare that to the agitate, there were about 681 milligrams per cup. So I'm going to step back a second. The, um, when we were making the FDA samples, we observed that the, um, the FDA method requires the use of toxic organic solvents, so um, methanol, which they are evaporated out during the process of, of making the products. Um, but there's a potential danger if someone who doesn't know what they're really doing, they could leave some of those toxic solvents in. Um, and the resulting tea was also odorless and colorless. It was just a clear, watery liquid. So from a market standpoint, this wasn't a very appetizing product. <laughs> um, so I went back to the literature and I found that the literature estimates that a cup of tea should have about 180 milligrams of saffron per cup. And if you remember, I said, um, I think I got the number right. We ran, when we ran this, the sassafras tea samples, we found about 188 milligrams per cup. So this was about the same amount of saffron that the literature predicted. Um, but when we ran the agitate samples, remember I said there were about six, it was 680, 681 milligrams per cup. Um, we found then, therefore, that the agitate samples had more than three and a half times more saffron than the traditional tea samples. Um, it's difficult to say why the agitate samples had so much more saffron than the literature predicted, um, but if you compare the two samples, because we use the same HPLC um, methods, then we can compare these and say that the traditional method did reduce the saffron content. Um, I'm going to go back to the literature again and compare how much saffron you're consuming per cup of tea that you drink. Um, if we use a dose translation formula, we can also compare, we can compare that number to studies that used animals. And if, if we look at one study that tested um, rats, there was a dose, the, um, one study tested a single dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram. Um, and they found only two DNA saffron adducts. Um, there, were do there were two studies on dogs that they were, the dogs were fed five milligrams per kilogram, which is roughly amount, the, about the amount of saffron found in a cup of tea. Um, these dogs were, they were fed the saffron for six years, and they found some minor liver damage. Um, and there was, so there's another study that fed dogs saffron for seven years. And they also found some minor liver damage, but they, uh, as the study went on, the liver damage decreased, and they, hy they hypothesized that the, the lack of liver damage later in the study was due to adaptations to the, con the continuous exposure to saffron. Um, but, so when I was looking at these limited number of studies, there were a couple more, um, there was no carcinogenesis or liver tumors um, that were found in the, the doses listed. So, should you guys drink the tea? That's the question, right? <laughs> um, and why did Native American communities and later Appalachian communities drink the tea? It wasn't known 100 years ago that saffron is a proven um, carcinogen. It, it causes macro and micro liver lesions, liver tumors, inability to gain weight, and reduce feeding in laboratory rats. But maybe these symptoms exhibited by laboratory animals can make sense when we con consider the traditional um, medicinal qualities of, of sassafras tea, why it was originally used in the first place. Um, if I, you remember I said before it was a spring tonic, it's used to thin the blood in the spring um, when, when the weather is heating up. Um, it was also used for over fatness, I found that in one study, which I thought was a great term. <laughs> um, so s laboratory rats had uh, difficulty gaining weight or had a reduced appetite when using, when, when on saffron, when they were given saffron. Um, humans perhaps used a small amount of saffron and sassafras tea to help 
shed winter pounds or, or built up toxins um, during the winter. Um, and more studies, of course, is, is um, needed to prove this, but maybe we can look at these products um, with sassafras as a medicinal or occasional indulgence um, in order to understand the risk of using saffron instead of banning altogether. Um, so that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you.